react india so hi everyone how is everyone doing enjoying goa all right so today we're going to be uh, have a, take a quick glimpse at how we can build a notion like intuitive rich text editor for the masses first of all thank you all of uh, all of you all for being here i think on a fine friday evening in goa you chose to attend this talk i hope to make up to it all right so about me i am rajat kapoor i have been trying to create the perfect rich text editing experience since the past 6 and a half years across like three jobs and countless of rich text editing libraries i currently work as the product engineering lead at hashnode do you folks know what hashnode is show of hands anyone see that's why the talk title had notion and not hashnode <laughs> so uh hashnode is the hassle free blogging platform for engineers you can see my design skills in this chart so in this poorly designed chart i have like listed down the features that hashnode has so we are kind of like medium but majorly for the tech bloggers for the tech industry so a lot of the unique features that we have are oriented towards tech people just like you so we have backups automatically to github we have the best in class markdown based visivig editor we have code syntax highlighting and code blocks that even works with newsletters so you are writing an article with a set of code blocks that syntax highlighting will even appear in the newsletter of your subscribers and a lot of other things most importantly you own your own data at all times and it is hosted on your custom domain so it is not on something.com/your name but it is your name.com so basically you would carry on the seo benefits even if you plan to move away from hashnode for any reason we'll try to prevent you to do that we'll give you all the features that you want but that is what basically hashnode is so why are we talking about rich text editors so there are a few points i think like ankit already mentioned a few points but it allows you greater flexibility and control to your users on what they want to input but it also allows you to control what the users can input and understand the intent that what they want to input whether they want to upload an image whether they want to write something whether they want to write text or whether you want them to write any constrained text and you encounter rich text editors more often than you think in fact if you think about it most of the non mouse interactions that happen on the web mostly happen inside a rich text editor think of things like discord that small little box that you see is the rich text editor it has a lot of functionality built and if you press slash you see a menu with all the options think about google mail gmail think about google docs slack twitter you all love twitter right all of these are rich text editors so last year when we decided to revamp our hashnodes uh, editor we went ahead with a combination of these libraries we looked at all of these libraries we are not a very big team so obviously we had to go open source even for bigger teams i think that's the best way to go so we looked at open source libraries and we had a few criteria that we were looking at it should be extensible right so you should be able to build up on top of it easily it should be mature enough it should have been there for a while so that it you, you can like trust it it should be used and backed up by some big corporations so that it doesn't die off or go into that grave state of un unmaintainability and it should be actively developed and maintained so we looked at all these libraries slate is my personal favorite uh, there's lexical that's looking very promising it's a library from meta uh, but we went ahead with something called tip tap it was one of those libraries that has a very easy extensibility built on to top of it so you can build things and it has like a very nice support for react as well as vue so uh now we'll uh and using that we created hashnodes rich text editor which we uh, code named neptune blog at the speed of thought we said neptune is a markdown based visivig editor uh for composing blog posts as quickly as you can imagine and it had ai under the hood so we did not have like any uh, any of our own ai we were integrating with open ai but like with the advent of gen ai and how well it was working with tech related uh, text related stuff I think it was a no-brainer for Hashnode to integrate with uh, OpenAI. So with this, what we were able to do is we were able to give the users a Visivig editor. We were able to help them see like live formatting. They could add any sort of content blocks, embeds, tweets, 
iframes, math equations, which they were like, they could see the preview of when they were typing, so things like tables and a lot of interactivity. And we also took care of a lot of things with the AI, like the images that I, I think that's this thing has been brought up twice today already, and I'm the third person bringing it up. Any image that you uploaded onto Hashnode, you had a way to use AI to generate all text for it automatically on a click of a button. And same for all the SEO related fields, SEO description, meta tags, and all of these things. Hashnode takes care of, uh, of all of these things for you. And we were not just like randomly generating all of these things. We are taking care, like our prompts were taking care of uh, written in such a way that all, uh, all the requirements of all the search engines were being taken into account. So like I think uh, Google or Google has a peculiar thing that the brief of an article of a blog type article has to be less than 156 characters. So we made sure that the output of the AI was less than that and that's not an easy feat to do. But we kept on reiterating over it until we reached a prompt that finally did that. And the result was when we launched Neptune, we satisfied a lot of our users. They were happy. We saw a lot of big users, big people in open source moving, moving their blogs to Hashnode. And now we will uh, actually look at some code. So I'm going to give you a brief primer on rich text editors. So we are going to look at code that talks about tip tap. We look at code that I wrote in tip tap where we'll explain how we can build a rich text editor. But the concepts that I'm talking about here are fairly generic. So even Slate or Prose Mirror or Quill or uh, Lexical, they all use a very similar concept. So we will talk about a concept, then we look at some code. All right. And the prerequisites here are nothing fancy. You just need like basic understanding of HTML, JavaScript, or TypeScript, and React. And goes without saying, my talk is not prepared for 30 minutes. It's going to be a shorter talk, so I'm open to accepting any questions that you have. Feel free to interrupt me anytime. Just raise your hand, and I'll be happy to answer questions. So the first concept that we'll look at is data formats. There are majorly two things that you need to worry about. First is the serialized data. So think of something like, if your user is coming on your website to write an article, Serialized data format is the data that is the format of the data in which you store that article in your database. So it is optimized for storage in your database. It is optimized for reusing that data at other places apart from this rich text editor. It is optimized for human understanding so that you, if, if you look at the actual content or if a human looks at the actual content, they can make sense out of it. So examples for this are JSON, Markdown, or HTML. Like you can look at an HTML, you can reuse it at other places, you can render it right then and there, and you can run kind of queries on top of it as well. You can see whether that HTML document has an image or not. You can just load that into a DOM object and see that. And then there's deserialized data. Now, you do not need to worry about this too much, but there's something that's very important because this is your this is the data format that your editing library understands. So basically, when you give the serialized data to your editing library, or you deserialize the data and give it to your editing library, your editing library converts that into a tree kind of a structure that is very, very easily for uh, very, very easy for manipulating it in terms of the transformation that that library does. It will transform it into a data structure where it can do schema enforcement. It can enforce the rules that you have given it to that library. It can put events on top of images. For example, let's say you create a rich text editor in which you want that your images, when right-clicked on, they show a delete pop-up. This deserialized data would be in such a format that your editor can put on all, all these hooks on that data structure. Examples for this, again, JSON, HTML. A lot of these things can be done with HTML. So keep that as the bare minimum uh, thing in your mind or data structure in your mind. So on this, let's, let's take a look at some code. So this is what we are going to build. So we have a rich text editor here that says, hello, React India. So hello, React India. And I have a debugger on the right hand side. So as you can see, what we are seeing here is on the left hand side is the WYSIWYG editor. So there is a H1 tag that says, hello, React India. Then that's an empty paragraph in which my selection lies right now. And you can see that on the right hand side, we have like the formatted HTML that the editor is giving us. Now, how is this working? 
I want to show you something here. So let me know when I sh can you read the code? People at the back? Perfect. Hang on, let me just get this out of the way. So what I've done here is like I've created a very basic Next.js simple React app. This is the page that you were seeing at, uh, looking at. So we just have a heading, let's build a realistic editor, and then we have two components here. One is the editor, the second one is the content debugger. The content debugger just takes in an HTML string and prettifies and shows it to you. That is just for us observing what's happening in the editor. And then we have the editor component, which is again a custom component that we have created. It's built on top of TipTap, right? So as you can see, I'm uh, importing a few things from TipTap. The first thing uh, noteworthy that we want to see right now is that we are importing the use editor hook and the editor content component from TipTap slash React. We, can we are using the use editor hook here. We are passing an on update function to it. So whenever the content of the editor updates, the uh, tip tap calls this function, and then we can do whatever we want with it. As of now, what I'm doing here, the set function that you are seeing here, it's basically just writing it into a client side index DB. And that's all. We are doing nothing else. And apart from that, we have like uh, an external on update function being passed here that we are also calling. So basically what this function is doing is it's updating the state variable on the top level page, which essentially uh, triggers the re-render here for the content debugger so that you see the new content. And that's all. Apart from that, I'm also passing some content here, which is what you were seeing here. But I'll just quickly comment this out and get this use effect working so that our content is now being saved and being loaded from the the rich text, uh, like the index DB that we are saving on the front end. So basically, if I go here and I put in high, and then I just refresh it, you will see high being loaded. So that's what I did here. That's the only change we'll make here. So this is how, uh, for, for now, I think that, that that's all we need to know in terms of data format. But the fun thing to note here was that the content that we are providing to TipTap is an HTML. We are able to provide it HTML content, and it just knows how to render it. Right? How that works is, we'll jump on to that as well. And the content that we are getting back from TipTab is also HTML. So I'll show you where that happens. So we are getting, this editor is the object that we have from TipTab, and we are able to get HTML out of it. So basically, we are just working with HTML. The deserialized data, uh, the serialized data is HTML here. We are storing that. We are getting it from the index DB, passing it to the editor. Editor does not work with HTML. It like creates it its own tree structure there. But we are, it's able to give us back the HTML. So we are saved with the work here. Uh, where did my slides go? Hang on. Yep. All right. So we have covered this. The next thing that you need to, like again, this is a very generic concept, not related to tip tap at all. That's a schema. So basically schemas, so this like is a definition taken from Prose Mirror directly. Schemas provide something like a syntax for documents. They set down which structures or content are valid. Think of HTML. Think of semantic HTML. Let's not think of HTML. HTML works anyways. So think of semantic HTML. You can put a TR tag, a table row tag, inside a table only. Or you should, right? There's no point putting a TR tag inside the head tag or putting anything outside of the body tag that you don't want rendered, right? So schema is something like that that you are creating for your rich text document where you are explaining that these are the things that are allowed. How do we create schemas? We do that by a few things. First of those things is a node. So nodes are analogous to all content types that your editor supports. So again, Taking the basic example of HTML here, we do not need to correlate this much to HTML, but it makes things very easy. So examples of paragraph, list, tables, code blocks, all of these are node types that you'll have to code to be supported in your editor. And a node definition consists of like all sorts of metadata around it, whether it's an inline node or a block node. Again, similarity to HTML. Whether that node is a leaf node, whether it has like more children, or is it like the final node inside the tree of the document that gets created, and rules around where this node can be placed. Again, look back to the table example or list example. An li can only be placed inside a ul or an ol tag. So these are all things that we define in the node definition, and things around rules about what nodes it can contain. And we'll talk more about marks. 
So marks are set of extra styling that you add on top of nodes. So examples are bold, italic. So these are not node types, but these are marks that are applied to nodes or like a range of an inline node. So your node definition actually tells what all marks can be applied on it. So uh, mark definition again consists of some metadata types and whatever it needs to support. And uh, note that one or multiple marks can be applied to add extra styling or other information to inline content. So it's not that you can just apply one mark. So now we'll look at this chart again. This is fairly uh, resembling to what HTML is. Because we are work talking about WYSIWYG editors, at the end of the day, they have to generate some HTML that they render on the browser. So we have a document which is a top level node. Your schema would have only one top level node, which is a document in our case. And then a document can have paragraphs. It can have tables. It can have tweets, probably, which is like a non-standard HTML, like the, which is a, not an HTML thing, but it can have a tweet. And it can have list, which could be ordered or unordered. And then list, the, these, the things that I'm highlighting in yellow here are attributes. The thing that I'm highlighting in green are marks. So a list could have list items. List items could indeed have tweets, or list items could have paragraphs. Paragraphs could have text content, which might have an attribute called color. And there are these certain marks like bold, italics, and strike through that we allow on text content. And paragraphs could also have user mentions. So user mentions are something like Twitter, again, a non-HTML thing that we'll uh, look at how we can do. And then tables can have rows, and only rows can have cells. Cells can have paragraphs. Paragraphs can have text content. But the thing to see here is that looking at what we have built here, we cannot add tweets to cells inside of tables because that is something that's not supported with the schema. Now, uh, we'll take a look at how TipTap does this. So TipTap has a way of expressing the whole schema in terms of extensions. So all nodes, marks, all the things that your editor can do is exposed as extensions. And TipTap does a really good job at it. They have like a thing called a starter kit that lets you get a rich text editor ready very soon. So I've included these extensions there. The first extension that I've included is starter kit, which is something that's already available from TipTap. So you get all these things for free. You get like block code, you get a bold mark, bullet list codes, code blocks, the document, drop cursor, gap cursor. We can talk about these later. But headings, history, so that if you press Command Z, you get to that old state, you get horizontal rule, italics, list items, order list, paragraph, strike, and text. And that's not all what TipTap provides. There's the extensions for tables and whatnot. But the starter kit provides these things. So I would like to look at a few nodes for, or like code for some of the nodes in that starter kit. So the first node, most important one, document. This says that this is a top node. And there is only one node allowed in your schema that can be a top node. And this, with this content expression, what we are defining here is that this document can contain a list of blocks. Block plus means one or more blocks, not zero and more, one or more blocks. And then uh, we look at the definition for paragraph. So uh, for this also, like you, we can look at the content expression. It says that it can have zero or more inline nodes. Text content is an inline node, like the chart that we looked at. So it can have any text content. And then it also has some things around like parse HTML and render HTML. So parse HTML basically means that when we are giving our editor or tip tap the HTML, it knows what will create a paragraph node. So it will look at tags that start with P because we are passing it at HTML. So it will look at paragraph tags and create paragraph nodes out of those tags whenever it encounters them. And when, I, when, it ha when we ask it for the HTML, when we ask it for the get HTML method, then it will create a paragraph text using all of these attributes and then pass it to you. So th this is how like, the, these things work. And similarly, if you look at bullet list, the bullet list have, has like a content expression, which is a function. So you can basically pass what type of items you want to be included as a child of a bullet list. So in this case, we have this as list item. So uh, the other thing that you can pass to your rich text editor is like define what actions the user can take. These are behaviors. These could be global actions like typing at the rate, 
showing a user selection combo box, or what happens when a user presses enter. Or these could be node specific behaviors like right clicking on an Im image, showing a context menu, or pressing tab in a list, actually syncing the list item one level deep. So behaviors define all the actions that the user can take inside your editor. And in terms of the editor life cycle, so we have like serialized data that we store with ourselves, we deserialize it, give it to the editor. The editor does event handling, behaviors, it can do transformations depending on user actions. And it also does one very important thing, which is normalization. So what happens when a user has accidentally landed in an incorrect state? Or where the selection goes when the user presses enter or deletes a node? Where the selection goes? All of these things are handled by the editor. So now we look at some code and we'll add a tweet node. So I am not going to live code this, but we have a tweet node here that we will look at. All right. So I have created a new tip tab extension called tweet. The name is tweet. The group is block. What this means is that any other node that uses a content expression which says that blocks are allowed as a child here, this node can be used there. So basically, this becomes a block type node. We have shown that it, this is not like an inline node. And atom means basically this is a leaf node that does not have any other thing. So just to give you an example, what we are creating here is something like this. You would be able to do this inside your HTX editor. So you get a tweet node. And if you see here, you will see that the HTML say, has a tweet tag. Now, this is a structure that we are following here. This is not actual HTML. This is not valid HTML tweet. It's not a tag. But we can train the editor to understand what we want it to do with that. So how that works is that we have told it that whenever it encounters the tweet node in its schema, then it renders the tweet tag and renders all the attributes related to that. We do not have a lot of attributes here. The only attribute that we have here is tweet ID. right? And then we provided the behaviors on where it can get the tweet ID. When it's parsing the HTML, it can get the tweet ID from the tweet ID attribute that we are passing in the HTML. This is the tweet ID attribute here. And we also show when it wants to render the HTML, where it needs how it needs to return back the attributes that are automatically added to the HTML. And then we, uh, I think we have configured all of these things. The other thing to note here is like, where is React? We are talking in React India, right? So uh, this is where React comes in. So TipTap provides you a way to add React nodes instead of it actually rendering HTML. So what we were seeing earlier was that when we were passing it a heading node, a heading was being rendered, and the markdown was also a heading. Now what we have done here is that we have added a node view to TipTap in our schema. We have told TipTap that whenever it encounters a tweet node, rather than rendering HTML, which was this function, you add a node view there. And instead of rendering the regular HTML, you render the tweet component. So this tweet component just uses the uh, an external library called React Tweet from the good folks at Versal, and it renders the tweet. It also has like some uh, options that so basically these are the props that that tweet component gets from tip tabs. There's a selected prop. So whenever I select this, I see this edit button there, and I can press this edit button. I can uh, change the tweet ID. Let me change it to something else. So as of now, this has not been updated, but once I press submit, this is updated. Oh my god, we landed on a fairly nice tweet <laughs> from the initial days of Twitter, it seems. All right, so basically, uh, the thing is like TipTap allows you to add these React nodes and provides you the functions to see when that node is selected, to uh, give you the ability to update attributes on top of that node. And uh, it allows you to do that very, very easily. And apart from that, like I think there's uh, the other thing that TipTap allows you to do is also define these behaviors in like a much more useful way to make your editor more intuitive. So I think there's two more things that I'll cover. So one is like input rules. So basically, you can add in rules so that this node gets created when user types in a certain thing. So we, have, we can uh, define these rules by passing a regex. So as you've seen, like I've passed in a regex that if the user starts typing percentage t, it will create a tweet node. 
right? So let's try that out. So I'll just get rid of this. I press percent, I press T, and we get a tweet node. It is fairly empty, but we can add things inside this and submit, and it gets added. Now the other other thing to note here is uh, we will just uh, talk about normalization as well. So what I'll do is I'll add a list item in here. So as you can see, this is what we land up with. We have a UL inside that there's like an LI, and inside there there's a paragraph. I'll create a new one. You see that a paragraph automatically gets created here. So let's look why this is happening. So if you look at the list item node, the content expression that's here is paragraph space block star. This means that whenever you create a list item, the first thing inside that would be a paragraph followed by zero or more blocks. So the first list item here is an example of just a paragraph, while here it's a paragraph. And uh, I will start typing percentage T here. And as soon as I press T, you would imagine that a tweet block is inserted here, and that will happen. But it does not replace the paragraph block, because the first block inside the list item always have to be paragraph. The schema enforces that, and this is what the normalization cycle is. The editor won't let your content enter a state where it's not conforming to the schema. So this is automatically taken care of by TripTap. And as you see, I pressed like Command Z, and it got me back to this state. So this is the history plugin at play. So yeah, I think that is pretty much about my talk. But I will take you to the last page. So there's a QR code that has the links for uh, the stock, the code for the example, the hosted demo online, you can check it out here, and also some links for uh, the hash node editor that we have. That was all from my side. Thank you all. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. If you have any questions, I am happy to answer them. We have around like four minutes remaining. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I am Soumya. Hi. I work at Learn. Uh, it's an employee success platform. And uh, we have also built an inbuilt editor at Learn to uh, support uh, the rich text format. Amazing. My doubt to you is that you said you integrated AI into the editor. Mm -hmm. So the editor supports HTML markdown or JSON as the initial mm -hmm. input format. Right. Uh, my doubt to you is that OpenAI, how did you decide what output format should OpenAI give so that you can integrate seamlessly with the editor? All right, that's a, that's a fair question. I think what we have is that the AI doesn't directly integrate with the editor in like a way. What we have is like what we have is a layer. So basically, we have things in our image component. If you go to the alt text option, there's like a button there, and if you press that button, we make a call to OpenAI, and we uh, we have like tuned our prompts to return back the only with the response that we need, and then we insert it inside of the image node. So that is how we are working. We don't have like a uh, ready-made solution that we are using it, and there's like a layer in between that actually does the fetching of the, uh, that does the making of the call to OpenAI and gets that data and then uses that to populate that alt text field. So that's how we are using it. So it's like uh, the OpenAI would can return markdown format as, as well as a plain text format. Yes, uh, if, if you train it to, it does. So I think one of the problems that we are facing with our thing is like we have, uh, we have a capability where you can choose a piece of text in our editor and then you can ask it to rewrite it or change its tone. But what issues that we have been facing, we have been able to send Markdown to open AI, uh, a trained model of OpenAI that we use. And we have trained it on Markdown. But what we still see is that it still does not preserve content formatting. So if a certain piece of text was bold, it might just remove that in the output that it gives us. So I think, again, there's like a lot of hacks that we have had to tackle to build this, and it's, it's still not perfect. Also, just last question. Yeah, sure. Uh, do you guys support collaborative editing, and how do you guys manage it? At this point, we do not. But the library that we just spoke about, TipTap, that has like integrations with two really good collaborative editing engines or providers, if you may call it. There's one called YJS that you can use, and it works amazingly. We can, we have like uh, experimented with it. It's amazing. The other thing to look at is Live Blocks. There's this company called LiveBlocks.io that also integrates very well with TipTap, and they are like, yeah, you might have seen those 
cursors in like a lot of programs like Figma. If there's multiple people, you will see multiple cursors, the presence engine and all those things. Liveblocks does that very well and it integrates well with TipTap as well. So you can check these things out. Yes. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, so this is less about the talk and more about uh, Hashnode itself. Um, you, in one of the slides, you said it's a Markdown-based WYSIWYG editor. Um, I was just wondering why you chose Markdown, considering you know you have the tables, you have a lot of custom features, which um, I'm assuming is a lot more difficult in Markdown than uh, just HTML. Yes, so uh, that's a very good question. I have like two answers for it. Firstly, our users or like developers in general, they like working with Markdown. They're just very, very familiar with uh, Markdown shortcuts that pressing hash should create a heading. And those things, even though they don't exist inside of TipTab, what we did in our WYSIWYG editor was that we added shortcuts for all of these things. So basically, if you press hash, it converts it into a heading. If you press like hash twice, it's like an H2. So we did that. That's one of the answers. The second big thing is like we have a public API. So uh, we allow users to craft content. We allow, we, our API accepts strings from user using which they can create blog posts. We cannot ask that, we cannot provide them such fine grained controls where we, they can add like a tweet node or an embed node, but they can pass us just one big markdown string hmm. that we can transform into all of a blog post. So that is one of the biggest reasons why a lot of these editors or like rich text editors or these uh, things that have a public API, they mm -hmm. function on top of Markdown because in Markdown with one string, you can pass in a lot of content with a lot of formatting and the right. rendering is taken care of by like the applying the styles when we are rendering it. Understood. Uh, just a follow up question to that is um, you could technically uh, give the markdown features like hash this thing converts it to a whatever p tag or like yep. your bold tag or whatever but um, but still serialize it in html in and then store it that way um, and even in your api you could you know serialize that in and store it as html so um, are there any reasons why markdown is um, better uh, was I, used the, the markdown is better in no way it like restricts us a lot but I think like the uh, I think the point here is that we accept article creation via our API. Hmm. So either we'll have to ask the users to send us the HTML of the created document okay. or like what they want to publish, or we can ask okay. them to provide Markdown. Okay. So Markdown is fairly simpler there because it's fairly uh, I think like it's an unacceptable to ask users to send HTML to you for the article that they want to publish. And a lot of these things that are being published on Hashnode, like documentations or blog posts or things like that, they have a mark. They already have a markdown. They can just pass it to us, and that becomes a blog post. But yeah. Yes. Uh, are we? I think. Oh, okay. We're we're done with questions because I like I'm out of time. But we can wait outside, right? And anyone has any other questions you want to discuss about AI, text editors? Uh, I'm happy to chat. Thank you.